Alien has been scaring audiences for 40 years, an enduring classic that has become a rite of passage for horror and science fiction fans alike. On the front line, experiencing the film in its year of release, 1979, among other frightened moviegoers in theaters across the world. Many are still discovering Alien today on home video with digital releases and the recent 4K transfer on Blu-ray. But there is a considerable amount of fans who were first introduced to the crew of the Nostromo and the alien threat that stalked them in the 1980s and 90s on a home video format called VHS or on television. For years this was the only way you could see the movie at home on your TV which at the time was more of a box shape, not huge wide screens with high definition displays we take for granted today. Watching a movie at home came with certain disadvantages and certain compromises that had to be made to an originally theatrically released film in order for it to thrive in the home video market, and Alien was certainly no exception. These were the dark times, the days of pan and scan. The main problem generally is that the standard television during the days of VHS tapes was square, a 4-3 ratio, while many films, such as Alien, was made to play against a longer theater screen. In Alien's case, the ratio was 239-1. So in order to have a film fit in that smaller screen, the film was edited so that parts of the screen were cropped off, only focusing on what is perceived to be the most important elements taking place on the screen. Oftentimes, when a lot more was taking place on the screen at the same time, the focus had to be panned from one side to another, creating an artificial camera movement that didn't previously exist. If you're old enough to have experienced the heyday of VHS, you may recall the notification that preceded movies on the format, informing the viewer that the film had been modified from its original version and it had been formatted to fit your screen. Maybe you're younger and missed out on this era, or maybe you remember it like it was yesterday. But I'd like to take a painful look back at the format and how the pan and scan method affected Ridley Scott's Alien. One of the worst alterations they made for this pan and scan version is right at the beginning, during the opening credits. It's a great credit sequence, the title of the film slowly revealing itself as we move through space and eventually find the Nostromo. The problem is, the title, Alien, takes up the entire screen from one end to the other, and there's no way to zoom in on the image to fit the square ratio of a television without cutting off half the title. So, what do they do? They squeeze the image. That way it all fits, and hopefully no one at home would be the wiser. But if you had seen the movie theatrically, surely you'd sense something was off. And this carries over to the introduction of the Nostromo, since there was a fade to the next shot, and fades were a difficult thing to work around with this process. So the first time a home video audience is able to see the Nostromo and the informative text explaining its circumstances, it's all scrunched up. It looks like a smaller ship, not nearly as awe-inspiring as it should be. Really awful, but what else could they do? When the crew of the Nostromo is introduced, the widescreen version offers a full view of the hypersleep chamber, but obviously in the 4-3 ratio, a good deal of the image is cut off. It's a beautiful visual, and it allows the viewer to take in this environment and assess it a little bit before we see the first signs of life in Kane, which draws our attention. But in the zoomed-in, cut-off version of the shot, it forces the camera right into the very middle. Not because that's where our attention should be at the moment, but because in the next moment, there is a fade over to Kane, who is the first member of the crew to wake up. That first reveal of Kane stretching out his arm, slowly awakening from his long slumber, is in the middle of the frame, but this sequence also contains fades. This conveys that some time is passing, and it's a slow awakening. Ridley Scott described the crew as seven unsuspecting babies. You'll see here the first of many pans, because it fades from Kane first getting up in the center of the frame to him finally rising over on the right side of the screen. A calm, intentionally stagnant series of shots here, introducing the doomed crew, and in particular the doomed Kane, future father of the alien parasite, is given unnecessary and unintended movement. It's the scenes of dialogue and interactions between the crew that might suffer the most here. Take the scene where Captain Dallas, after speaking with Mother, explains that the crew is only halfway to Earth and that they're obligated to investigate the signal on LV-426, much to the protest of Parker and the agreeable Brett. In the pan and scan version, the camera pans away from poor Brett, since it's Parker doing most of the talking. He's cut out for most of this scene, but that's supposed to be the dynamic of the characters. Brett is always by Parker's side with a nod or a smile or a right. 
And that's established wonderfully through Harry Dean Stanton's performance here, which you can see in full view in the widescreen version, but unfortunately is completely chopped off in the pan and scan, and only occasionally panned back to in the home video version. With the VHS, we sadly miss little nuances like this. Since so much of the screen is cut off, we don't quite get the vastness of the Nostromo as it looms over the darkness of space, and there's one especially bad and hasty pan when the ship is approaching LV-426. It's supposed to be one stagnant shot, but the 4-3 version flies from left to right quickly in order to show both the planet and the Nostromo approaching, all in one frame. There's thankfully no artificial camera movement later on when the Nostromo slowly and majestically first makes its descent into LV-426. It's an absolutely beautiful shot to take in. The TV version takes away much of the awe and scale, focusing as usual right in the middle of the screen. In a widescreen presentation such as Aliens, a lot more is going on than just what's in the dead center of the screen. Take for example this scene where Dallas, Kane, and Lambert are preparing to leave the Nostromo to explore the planet. They begin on the left-hand side of the screen and then move into the middle as the airlock opens. The home video version has to pan and follow the action where the attention needs to be. Another slow, artificial camera movement that was not intended for this moment. A fair amount of LV-426 remains in the hidden because of the VHS aspect ratio, and we miss a lot of the stellar production design here. The sun in the background is completely cut off from the frame as the crew makes their trek through the harsh terrain and finally catch a glimpse of the derelict ship. One of my favorite shots is when we see the trio looking upon the ship in wonder, but here Lambert is cut off from the shot completely. As they move in closer to the derelict, we get a better look at it ourselves and its massive scale, but in the 4-3 presentation, we're really only seeing half of it. It's a daunting visual. We get an idea of just how massive this thing really is as we compare the ship to the three little lights approaching it, but we're losing so much of the image that it doesn't make as impactful of an impression as it should. Not to mention, we just lose out on seeing how incredible this design really is. The same goes for the reveal of the jockey. The camera pulls back and reveals the breadth of this ancient alien structure as the crew climbs up onto the platform, but a significant portion of this stunning image has to be sacrificed for the home video presentation. This is the only wide shot and full view of the jockey we get in the whole movie, so we miss out on the full impact. We miss out on that sense of discovery we're supposed to be sharing with the crew. Back on the Nostromo, there's a rather elegant fade from Ash at his console to the derelict, but since he's on a different side of the frame, we get maybe the worst and most distracting pans of the entire movie. The infamous chestburster scene begins with a pan in the VHS version, I guess to establish as best as possible that all the characters are present at this moment. And I guess that's because a lot of them end up getting cut out of the frame, such as Ripley here, where Ash is keeping a close eye on Kane, and Dallas, right beside him, having a conversation with Lambert, absent save for the beer in his hand. This scene, of course, is the most known, most talked about, most iconic scene of the movie. It's especially great for repeat viewings. Once you're past the initial shock of the moment, you begin looking for the little details, a lot of which, unfortunately, get lost in the home video VHS translation. For example, I get a kick out of Brett here, trying to help when Kane is convulsing. You see he still won't give up the cigarette in his mouth, which isn't noticeable in the pan and scan version. And considering the rampant rumors, almost urban legends, that the cast didn't know what was going to happen in the scene, you definitely want to take a good look at their reactions, and we lose a lot of that on the VHS as well. Dallas has a really good look of shock on his face. Lambert covered in blood behind Ash, as well as the spray of the blood on the wall, it all just goes missing. It's also probably worth noting that while, of course, the widescreen version you see on the right is the remastered version of the film, tuned to the specifications supervised by Ridley Scott, it obviously looks a lot better, you'll notice that the VHS version is actually a lot brighter. This is likely because viewers probably wouldn't be able to pick up on the image as distinctly on televisions at the time, so the brightness is turned up almost to the point of looking washed out. Seems counterproductive for a film that's about a monster that pops out from out of the dark to kill you, especially in the scene with Dallas in the vents where you can get a better glimpse of it by the light of his flamethrower before the big reveal. You still see it a little bit in the widescreen version, but maybe not quite as obvious. 
we get a scarce few looks at the alien, so the 4-3 version gives us even less in that scene, even if it's just a really quick shot. In the full, widescreen view, it almost feels like the alien is reaching out and grabbing the entire audience. On the square, television, VHS view, maybe not so much. Alien is meant to be an immersive experience, and the 239 aspect ratio is indicative of that intention. In its widescreen presentation, we get a fuller sense of the Nostromo and its surroundings in general. It's a living, breathing thing almost, and certain things might catch our attention as the viewer. With pan and scan, we're basically being told what's important, and what we should be looking at, and when. We miss so many little details that all add up to make this environment so realistic, even something as seemingly trivial as a monitor in the background or the nudie magazine pictures on the wall, which I guess I can't show you here anyway. But it takes so much away. It obstructs the artistic intentions of the shots composed by Scott and cinematographer Derek Van Lint. There are images in this movie that are works of art that convey certain feelings and they're actually kind of ruined. We follow the action but lose the soul of the movie almost. It's such a great, morbid visual to see Ash after being decapitated with his head on the table and his body right next to him, leaking out all the white, gooey, robotic innards. It feels obviously less provocative on the VHS and reduces the image to, well, a talking head. Another great scene that I think was compromised pretty severely is the heated conversation between Ripley and Parker after Dallas' attempts to kill the alien failed and he went missing. Ripley is in the focus, in the foreground of the shot, to the left, with Ash in the middle and Parker on the right, both out of focus. In the 4-3 version, we don't see Parker at all, despite hearing him, and despite Ripley looking right at him. But consider the alternative they could have taken, panning back and forth to a blurred character in the background. It would have been disastrous. Almost as disastrous as the final shot of the film with Ripley in her cryotube, which is hilariously squished thin to fit the screen. All because the worst enemy of the pan and scan process appears after this shot, a fade. Fading to space and the closing credits, which needed to be squeezed in like the opening credits were. It's been quite some time since popping in my VHS copy of Alien, and watching it over for the sake of this video, it's truly shocking to look back and think about how this was the common practice, the standard and acceptable way to view movies at home. It seems so primitive now, and I can't believe this was how I was introduced to Alien. And it's not just me, obviously I'm not a special case or anything, an entire generation of fans saw Alien that way. It didn't mean it was any less effective, it didn't mean we came to love the film any less, but at the time we were at a disadvantage, perhaps unknowingly too. If I can briefly touch upon the sequels and their VHS presentations, well, James Cameron's Aliens at least caught a little bit of a break when it came time to pan and scan the film for home video. Cameron presented the film in a 185-1 aspect ratio, much less sprawling than 239. It's the only film in the series to date that has done so. A lot of viewers today actually seem to prefer that aspect ratio, since it's best compatible with the 16 by 9 ratio made for widescreen televisions, but back then it still had to fit inside the box. While the theatrical widescreen version wasn't quite as wide, it still had to be modified for the 4-3 television ratio and parts of the screen still were cut off. Certain characters are omitted from shots, such as with the mess hall scene on the Sulaco, and there are some slight pans here and there. Also unable to make it into the frame is the full shot of the APC, partly on fire, as Ripley escapes with the surviving marines from the colony. Some eggs in the hive don't get fully shown in certain shots. Details definitely go missing, and it's still an unfortunate compromise of the original theatrical presentation. But for Aliens, it's not quite as drastic and not as noticeable as what had to be done with Ridley Scott's film. Alien 3? Forget about it. Of the original trilogy, David Fincher's film, originally shot in the same 239 aspect ratio as the first Alien, got the worst pan and scan treatment. It was a complete butchering of an already flawed film. Even those who aren't fans may end up admitting it's at least a visually interesting movie, but that's hard to grasp with the VHS version. Characters and scenery get cut out of the frame entirely. There is an abundance of panning, as seen previously. 
But taking it even further, this home video version not only employs artificial camera movements, but even artificial cuts from one end of the screen to the other. Such as this scene where Clemens confronts Ripley and they're on opposite ends of the screen. The pan and scan version conjures up its own cuts between characters in order to follow the conversation. And the film's most iconic scene, the moment shown in all the ads and posters and back covers of the VHS tape, is wildly tuned with in order to fit the frame. We get the artificial camera pans and separate shots all within a few seconds and all within what was supposed to be just one dramatic shot of the film. Absolutely dreadful. Absolutely painful to watch. Even after all the production problems that plagued the film, it seems it still wasn't quite done suffering when it hit the home video market. An interesting note about the VHS version of Alien 3, though, is that actually the first few minutes of the film are presented in the widescreen format, with the black bars on the top and bottom of the screen, referred to as the letterbox format. This was a workaround to accommodate for the opening credits, cut between moments of the Slocko's fire, Ripley's escape in the pod, and graphics that would appear on the screen, informing us that our favorite characters had died. Most interesting is the shot of Ripley on the table in the med lab, slowly zooming into her face. As the camera zooms in, the image transitions from letterbox to 4.3, now fitting the television screen. Not something you see too often on this format. There seemed to be a time where the square televisions and VHS tapes were here to stay. Filmmakers and film enthusiasts were opposed to the pan and scan format though, and during this reign, there was a noble effort to provide an alternative. The Laserdisc made its way into the market and offered the original theatrical presentation of films along with special features that would become standard and almost expected today, like behind the scenes footage and audio commentaries. 20th Century Fox Home Video, to their credit, was always going above and beyond with their releases, and in the early 90s released Laserdisc editions of the Alien Trilogy that were the absolute best home video presentations available at the time. But, unfortunately, Laserdiscs just didn't catch on. They were expensive systems, it was costly to build a respectable library, and with the widescreen television not quite yet on the horizon, most viewers found the letterbox format objectionable. A lot of people didn't quite get it, thought they were getting less of an image instead of more. So the masses stayed with VHS and their square TVs until the big DVD boom of the 2000s, Fox once again being on the forefront with its excellent Alien Legacy box set in 1999. And with that boom, widescreen TVs eventually became the standard. Aside from Laserdisc, and a little bit before the DVD age, Fox Home Video did eventually actually make the Alien films available in their letterbox formats for the VHS audience. The Fox Widescreen Series. Nifty clamshell cases, THX remastered, and the original intended aspect ratios of the films were made available on tape in 1997. This, for me, was my first step into experiencing the true versions of these movies. I remember ordering them from HMV, which took weeks, and finally bringing them home, and seeing them was a revelation. Especially with the first and third movies. It was like watching them for the first time, seeing all that I was missing, experiencing the superior THX remastered picture and sound quality. I thought it wouldn't get any better than that. Then, of course, it continued to get better. Alien was swept up in the digital revolution. The DVDs followed, then the Blu-rays, now 4K, at least for the first film, at least for now. Alien has undoubtedly made tremendous strides in its home video presentation since first becoming available in the early 80s, and it's a movie that's worth preserving and becoming available for each new format for new audiences. There's a part of me that feels a little chagrined to first have seen it in what now feels like a supremely, supremely inferior format, but at the same time, I do feel grateful in being able to witness and appreciate how it evolved along with home theater technology. I don't look back on it as a negative. Ultimately, in fact, in making this video, I couldn't help but feel a little nostalgic for those more innocent VHS days of my youth. Alone in the dark basement, only illuminated by the light of the television. The subtle humming buzz of the VCR playing the tape. Eyes glued to the screen being taken on a horrifying journey into space where, as you know, no one can hear you scream. 
Was your first viewing experience with Alien on VHS or TV with the pan and scan formats? Did you first get a chance to see it on DVD? 